All right, welcome back again for another episode of The Daily Show. Thank you for joining me today. This episode is for Thursday, August 19. And uh, some of the things we will be talking about today would be for the observances, we'll talk about something spicy. Um, and then we're going to be talking about something cold. And then something starchy. <laughs> starchy, is that a word? Starchy? Not sure. <laughs> For our history section, or today in history, we'll talk about uh, the first race at the Indianapolis Motor Raceway. There you go. For our notable figures, we got two. That's why I said figures. Um, one's a president, and or a former president, and then the other one is a uh, pioneer or an inventor. You know. And as usual, stay tuned for our stuff of the day because we have specific themes for our stuff of the day. By the way, how are you guys doing? I just want to share that I just had my afternoon snack. So I am ready to go right there, ready to go. All right, let's start off. Today's observances. First one, I said something spicy. It's because today is National Hot and Spicy Food Day. Ugh. I don't know if I, if I mentioned it to you guys before, but uh, eating something spicy for me or even thinking about Something spicy kind of makes my head itchy for some reason. I, I built a little bit tolerance on a certain level, not, not still up there, but hey, I, now I can enjoy some uh, spicy food. And actually, they they taste better. Uh, some of the food that I tried uh, felt like they taste better if they're spicy. So, yeah. But anyways, we are starting off hot on our first observance. This day is dedicated to hot and spicy foods. Um, some hot foods include wasabi, which I personally prefer just because the reason being is that the spiciness or the kick of the spiciness of wasabi doesn't really last long. Like yeah, it, it's gonna sting you a little bit, but after a few seconds it's gone. Plus, uh, from uh, what we learned from Ian, the wasabi that uh, they're serving here in the US, or pretty much in a lot of countries, a lot of places, they're not really the original wasabi because the original one uh, kind of goes bad right away and the fact that you have to go to a specific place by the mountains to harvest them and it's gonna take you like a very long time to go down and and get it to the restaurant you know and horseradish now that second one I'm not a fan of yeah the same and some spicy foods are made with peppers that are made with peppers that have high capsaicin content. Uh, there is some information that suggests capsaicin is good for your health. Uh, you should be familiar with the capsaicin already. Joe had an episode of The Daily Show, which this was the theme, capsaicin, right there. And speaking of that, uh, the capsaicin content are higher or, I mean, you know, for, for a uh, spicy food or for the spicy pepper to be to be on the high higher uh, level of spiciness, then it needs to have a higher capsaicin. Um, so it's going to be higher in the scale. And that scale is called the Scoville scale. There you go. The scale, the Scoville scale was named after the pharmacist uh, Wilbur Scoville. He wanted a standard measurement to which uh, to compare pepper hotness, but found the only way to do so was by human taste. So guess what happened? Uh, he had people actually tasting uh, the peppers. Oh man, uh, the tongue could detect lower concentrations of capsaicin than machines could. So to perform the test, dried pepper is soaked in alcohol and then diluted in sugar water. The solution is diluted more and more until a uh, panel of five trained testers can no longer detect it. So, I don't know, imagine that being your job. <laughs> uh, pepper taster, or, or uh, uh, how do you say it? Like pepper, uh, well, yeah, pepper tester, I guess, because you have to test the spiciness of the pepper. 
Anyways, if you are wondering what the hottest edible pepper is as of now, um, that title goes to the Carolina Reaper, being measured up to, oh my gosh, 2,200,000 Scoville heat units, or SHU. Um, as comparison, yeah, I mean, yes, it's by the million level right there, but it's still kind of hard to imagine it without any comparison. So, for those of you guys who find jalapeno uh, spicy already, well, guess what? Jalapeno only scales between 2,500 to 8,000 SHU. <laughs> like, way, way, way below the scale, you know? Well, not, I mean, it's not the lowest, but it's still in there, you know, the lower category, lower level. And then uh, the Tabasco hot sauce. You guys, have you guys tried the, the Tabasco hot sauce? I would say they're more they're, they're more spicy than the jalapeno, but still it only scales between 30 to 50,000 SHU. So still nothing compared to 2,200. Oh wait, no, no, no. 2,200,000 uh, Scoville uh, heat units that the uh, Carolina Reaper had. Uh, yeah, thought about spiciness. And then I did mention edible pepper because there are other um, other two that is above the uh, the Carolina Reaper. The one next to it, or the, the one above this, is the uh, pepper spray. Well, you don't you don't eat pepper spray, so that's so why. And then the hottest hottest level up there currently is, and probably will be, is pure capsaicin. So I mean that's. In the first place, that's the uh, the uh, the chemical that you have to have in order to make the peppers or anything spicy. So yeah. Um, okay, so for this observance, my question to you is: What's the hottest food or pepper you've tried? And for me, I'm gonna say. No, I haven't tried to ask myself though. No. But I I kind of thought it's. It's more spicy than a jalapeno. I would say jalapeno would be the spiciest like uh, food or vegetable or, or, or pepper that I tried. And that's not even on the middle section of the of the tier, you know? It's like very low, low tier right there. So what about you guys? Uh, it doesn't need to be a, uh, a pepper. It could be a dish. Yeah, have you tried a spicy dish? Let me know in the comment section below and if you had some spicy experience in food, why not cool it down with our next observance? So first, something spicy. Or rather, something hot. Next one, something cold <laughs> and icy and soft. Not just your regular ice cream, it's Soft Ice Cream Day. There you go. National Soft Ice Cream Day is our second observance. Um, you'll find them at Mr. Softy, DQ, Dairy Queen. And Carvel may uh, all come to mind when you think of soft ice cream, also known as soft serve, the most popular ice cream in the United States. Uh, lucky for us, it's National Soft Ice Cream Day, so it's a good alibi or a <laughs> good reason to uh, go get some, go get one, you know, or go, or go get some. But that shouldn't be the only reason. I mean, summertime, you know, it's, it's kind of hot. And speaking of hot, my room is getting warmer with all the lights and the computer turned on. So, I don't know, maybe maybe after recording or yeah, maybe after editing this episode, I'll uh, go grab myself some soft ice cream, right? Okay, going back to the observance, the first reference to soft ice cream appear, appeared in the first half of the 20th century. Stories conflict to its origin with both um, Carvel and Dairy Queen laying claim to inventing it. All right, so we got two people uh, kind of like trying to get the, the the title of who made it first. So let's go ahead and talk about Carvel first. The Car Carvel story or Carvel's story uh, say that on Memorial Day in 1934, his truck, by the way, his full name is Tom Carvel. So his truck had been selling ice cream or his truck that had that is being used to sell ice cream got a flat tire instead of trying to find a way home uh, what he did was he pulled his trailer into the nearby pottery store parking lot 
and then continued to sell his ice cream. Well, you know what's gonna happen? Uh, his original ice cream will start to kind of like melt a little bit, right? After being out so long, his ice cream started to melt and he began telling customers that the partially melted ice cream was the new type of dessert right there. I mean, way to go to market your melting ice cream. Uh, props to you, Mr. Carvel. Um, his ice cream became a hit. <laughs> okay. And he continued to sell it. Um, he opened the first Carvel store that year. Um, Carvel ice cream contains egg yolks. So, technically, it's a custard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I guess that's kind of out of the... Uh, I mean, his is already out of the, um, the list. Then... We got Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen claims that founder J.F. McCullough and his son Alex invented soft ice cream in the mid-1930s. Um, the pair had been making hard ice cream, but made some new ice cream where they changed its temperature from negative 5 degrees to 23 degrees, so it kind of got warmer. Which McCullough thought uh, brought out its flavor. That's their kind of like main reason to uh, increase the, the temperature. You know? So they continued to experiment and use 5% or 6% butter fat instead of 10. Then they settled on 18 degrees Fahrenheit for the temperature. So they kind of, um, first they changed it from negative 5 to 23. And then when they finalized, they lowered it uh, 5 degrees more. So that, that's how they got uh, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in, the, in 1939, they purchased a machine from someone selling frozen custard. Huh, I wonder if that was a uh, Cardville. <laughs> Probably not. And then what they did is they reconfigured it and opened Dairy Queen in 1940, where they sold, sold their first uh, soft ice cream. There we go. I mean, officially, officially, because they were still kind of like trying it out, right? Um, and speaking of special machi machine, a special machine is used to make soft serve ice cream. Um, the soft serve mix arrives at stores or restaurants in one of two ways, powdered mix or liquid. The uh, powdered mix is a more common and cheaper and is reconstituted or sorry. The powdered mix is more common and cheaper and is reconstituted with water. Uh, packets of flavoring such as chocolate or vanilla come in powder or liquid form and can be added. So yeah, I mean like your powdered mix. More premium soft serve is made with a pre-mixed liquid that comes in pouches. Um, it also allows for a more consistent product, but it usually needs to be refrigerated and only has a uh, shorter uh, shelf life, you know, approximately two months. So. Uh, yeah, compared to other ice cream, basically that could last more than that. Um, which is like what, about a year or uh, half a year, you know, six months shelf life. Um, the liquid mix may come in different flavors and contain chunks of chocolate, candy, or fruit. There you go. So, yeah, have you guys tried a uh, soft ice cream? I thought I did try soft ice cream, but and then I just realized it was just yogurt, you know, from uh, yogurt land. <laughs> so. And then, last observance or last main observance that we'll be focusing on, something starchy. That's what I said at the first uh, part of this episode. And I'm still not sure if the word starchy is a word right there. Potatoes, National Potato Day. Potatoes, whose name comes from the Spanish word patata, are one of the most common vegetables and most important crops in the world. I mean, if I am not mistaken, Pretty much all of the countries in the world have some sort of potatoes, you know, or have tried potatoes. So. They are part of the nightshade family and are tubers, a swollen part of the stem that provides nutrients for the leafy part of the Solanum tuberosum plants. Right there. Um, potatoes are almost always eaten cooked, not raw. Uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta tell me if you know someone who's eating potatoes raw. Uh, you gotta tell them that's that's not the right way to eat it. You have to cook it. You know, you don't have to fry it. There are other ways to cook uh, potatoes. Um, so 
<clears throat> Most of them also are eaten processed. Many uh, being thought frozen in bags instead of being made fresh. Uh, some of many ways they are prepared at, are as like, you know, baked potatoes, which is, I would recommend it instead of uh, frying it. Um, steam. There you go. Mash. Mashed potatoes. Boil. You know, you can boil potatoes too. There you go. Uh, and then we got the uh, your classic or, or most common ones. Deep fry French fry right there. But uh, technically though you can you can use air fryers these days now. You can actually air fry uh, French fry. So if you're worried about the oil content that you're gonna be using when cooking them. Uh, steak fries, waffle fries, home fries, hash browns, and potato chips. So the rest of uh, the last ones that I mentioned are kind of like fried, deep fried. There you go. Um, anyways, going back in time, first cultivated in South America sometime between 5000 to 7000 BCE in the area that is now southern Peru and northwest of Bolivia. Potatoes were brought back to Europe um, in the 16th century. Scotch Irish immigrants were the first to bring them to North America, introducing them to New Hampshire in 1719. And uh, from there, they spread across the continent. Today, uh, potatoes are grown in all 50 states here in the U.S. with largest production um, being in Idaho. There you go. And I think Luis already uh, uh, mentioned this to one of her uh, geography session with our students, with you guys. Common varieties of potatoes are red potatoes, white potatoes, yellow potatoes, purple, russet, fingerling, and petite potatoes. Right there. So, and then potatoes are also starchy. Yay, it is a word. Yeah, I wasn't sure if starchy was actually a word. Um, but yes, they are starchy, simple carbohydrates with high glycemic index, meaning that they can heighten blood sugar and insulin and then make it dip. Now, because of that, a lot of people tend to view potato or the potato more like a grain than a vegetable because they I mean, the, uh, the, the result you get from eating uh, potatoes are kind of similar to eating grains. Uh, so, this is just another simple and easy observance. I know, potatoes, right? Um, spicy food actually is kind of easy, uh, if ever. If you can tolerate spiciness, then why not? If your diet allows, that's easy. Um, this one also is easy. And uh, the ice cream is easy. So, we got pretty much... Uh, easy main observances that we just discussed today and uh, if there's by any chance you can't still celebrate any of these don't worry because I got you covered uh, we still have other notable observances right there so let's go ahead and run through them we got National Sandcastle and Sculpture Day there you go it's like another form of art some people are painting some people are singing some people are actually decorating cake or food Edible ones, or edible arrangement and all. Hey, here's another form of art right here. Sandcastle and sculpting. There you go. And uh, if you guys remember one of our... Uh, is it Joe Party? Oh yeah, Joe Party. When we did the Joe Party, uh, we had one category about Sandcastle and Ian kind of named it Sandy Palacios <laughs> right there. Sandy Palacios. Um, next one, we have National Aviation Day. And then we also have World Photo Day. So World Photo Day, uh, what you can do is you can uh, look in your photos and pick at least five. It was just my. This is just my suggestion, though. All right. So pick at least five photos and talk about it. You know, I'll talk about it if you uh, if you can. Mm, let's see what else. World Humanitarian Day. There you go, World Humanitarian Day. And lastly, we got International Orangutan Day. So, yeah, I mean, these are other notable observances uh, in case you want to celebrate more or you wanted to celebrate these instead of the main ones if you can't celebrate them. So, and now moving on to Today in History. So, what did I uh, mention at the start of the show? The uh, first race, which is held at the uh, Indianapolis 
Motor Speedway. I have to I have to kind of say it slow. I'm not I'm not good at pronouncing those three words together like fast. Indianapolis Motor <laughs> Speedway. I'm really getting tongue twisted. Now the home of the world's most famous motor racing competition, the Indianapolis 500. Um, that happened in 1909 of this day. Uh, built on 328 acres of farmland, five miles northwest of Indianapolis, Indiana, the Speedway was started by local businessmen as a testing facility for Indiana's growing automobile industry. The idea was that occasional races at the track would pit cars from different manufacturers against each other. And after seeing what these cars could do, spectators would presumably head down to the showroom of their choice to get a closer look. So yeah, I mean, again, another good strategy on uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, what it calls promoting promoting uh, automobile, uh, even like the industry itself. You know, uh, if of course by default, a lot of these people would be would would prefer something faster. You know, all right. So the first race, right, in that first five-mile race on August 19, 1909, remember this is 1909, um, 12,000 spectators watched Austrian engineer Louis Schwitzer, or Louis Schwitzer, win an entire, with an average speed, are you guys ready for this? Average speed of 57.4 miles per hour. <laughs> and again, that's why I keep emphasizing it was back in 1909. Now the cars these days can go up to, theoretically, 160 uh, or higher, you know. But I mean, the cars now, especially on the freeway, if there's no traffic, the average speed would be like 70, 80 miles. Even though a lot of these uh, freeway, they have the sign that a maximum speed is 65, you know. Some people would go like, more than that, 70, 80. This one average speed in a racing competition, again, because racing, you gotta consider uh, cars have to be fast. But again, uh, going back in the 1909, um, that was only the time that uh, automobile industry are, are starting to to uh, be part of, of our lives. So, um, the following decades, uh, we started having innovations, we started having uh, uh, evolutions and, and new findings uh, that helped us make, the, uh, make our cars faster now, right? So, the track's surface of crushed rock and tar proved to be a disaster, however, breaking up in a number of places and causing the unfortunate demise of two drivers, two mechanics, and two spectators. So imagine that, even if the average speed was only 50 miles per hour, uh, it's still, it's still, uh, what do you call this? It still did have a lot of a uh, mess, basically. I mean, it, it, yeah, there, there were, dis it was a disaster. So, I mean, what more if you're watching um, the latest races now, you know, NASCAR, uh, of course, this one, the Speedway, the Indianapolis 500, they're like running for more than hundreds of miles now, you know. All right, next up we have notable figure born today. Um, I did say we got two figures, so yes, I got two. Let's start with the uh, inventor or the pioneer of aviation because today is also um, National Aviation Day. So we got Orville Wright, 1871. He is known for inventing and building the world's first successful airplane with his brother Wilbur Wright. There you go. So it's Orville and Wilbur, the Wright brothers. And then for the next one, we have a former president, Bill Clinton, right there. 1946, uh, he was a governor of Arkansas. Uh, and then he became the first two um, Democratic or first two term Democratic presidents since. FDR serving 99, from 1993 to 2001. Oversaw a period of strong econo economic prosperity in the US and signed the North America Free Trade Agreement or the NAFTA. Now, his second term, of course, I mean, everyone has a uh, highs and lows, goods and bads, you know. So, his second term uh, was marred by a scandal involving the intern Monica Lewinsky 
for which he was impeached in 1998, but acquitted in the following year, which is 1999. So he was uh, one of the presidents, the U.S. presidents that got impeached. All right, moving on to the place of the week, we have Botswana. And since this is a Thursday episode, we'll talk about a uh, cultural landmark right here. We got the Todilo Hills. So Todilo Hills is a spiritual outdoor art gallery showcasing more than 4,000 ancient Sun Bushman rock paintings. Uh, I should have gotten a, a closer picture of the paintings, but if you guys pay attention, pay, pay closer attention all the way to the left side, uh, you'll see some of the uh, figures right there, animal figures to be more specific. Um, <clears throat> there are around 400 sites depicting hunting scenes, ritual dances, and typical safari animals. Some rock art dates back to more than 20,000 years. Wow, and archaeolo archaeologists have ascertained that people lived in this area as far back as 100,000 years ago. Wow, that was crazy to know. That was that was amazing, crazy amazing to know, you know? Uh, not surprisingly, because of that, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Visitors can expect to hike the three main hills with the assistance of a local guide. Um, there is a basic campsite and a small but informative museum um, on site right there. So, um, not as accessible as other uh, places, but if you are able to and if you wanted to, uh, if you're looking for adventures, this could be one, uh, one place that you could visit and enjoy, hopefully. Alrighty, now we're gonna be uh, moving to our stuff of the day. Let's start with our Disney animal version of animal of the day we got. <laughs> I was good. I almost, I almost said a different name just because that name of uh, our one of our students. He's pretty good at uh, imitating Donald Duck when it comes to the voice, you know. And yeah, he's always he's always showcasing his skill. Um, yeah, we got Donald Duck uh, for our animal of the day, and Donald is based from an animal called Pecan Duck. Pecan Duck. So this is the real picture of it. You see the resemblance, right? Minus the clothes. I mean, yellowish beak and white feather. So yeah, there you go. Uh, Pekin ducks are among the most popular breeds kept here in the United States, both in backyard and uh, homesteads across the country. Uh, Pekin ducks are a multi-purpose breed, meaning that they have uh, traditionally been raised for egg and meat production. The docile and sometimes affectionate nature of Pecan Ducks has also earned them intense popularity in keeping simply as farm animals or farm pets, you know, along with chickens. Agriculture stores like Rural King and Tractor Supply always stock Pecan Ducks or Ducklings amid their twice annual Chick Days event, uh, especially the event which occurs around Easter right there. Uh, another quick trivia about Pekin Ducks is, uh, aside from Donald Duck, another character uh, that is the same breed or, you know, that, that was based on a Pekin Duck uh, is the, was, or no, not was it, uh, you, you still see it, the mascot for the Aflac commercials. I don't know, every time I see the, the Aflac commercials, yeah, I, I kind of, you know, smile a bit and it gives me a little laugh, you know, Aflac, Aflac, something like that, so. Next up we have, oh, did I go back? Uh, sorry about that. Plant of the day, summertime. We're gonna be talking about the elephant's ear, not, well, it's plant of the day, so it is a plant. And we're not talking about literally the elephant's ear, but a plant that kind of resembles it, you know, like Dumbo, Dumbo ear, I guess. The reason why there are such popular plants is uh, to buy is because they are very easy to grow and will bloom for almost half of the year. Um, although this plant makes a great landscaping plant, the rainforest tropics and subtropics are where this type of plant grows the best. But yes, it can still be, uh, it can still survive uh, somewhere else. 
These plants have been cultivated for thousands of years near the equator, but no one knows for sure where they originated. Um, people who used elephant ears as crop food knew that uh, what makes this plant valuable is the fact that the entire plant is edible when properly cooked. Um, however, kids and pets should be kept away from elephant's ears because they can be poisonous unless cooked. That's a, that's a warning right there. There you go. All right, next would be the musical artist of the day still. We're still talking about Whitney Houston. And uh, our song that we're going to be tackling today or discussing today will be her song, Miracle, in 1991. Miracle is the third single from Whitney Houston's third album, studio album, I'm Your Baby Tonight. It was released on April 16, uh, 1991 by Arista Records. It was written and produced by L.A. Reid and Babyface. Um, the single, or this single, reached number nine on the uh, U.S. Billboard Hot 100, becoming her 13th top 10 hit. Uh, two on the R&B singles chart and four on the adult contemporary chart. That, I mean, come on, it's Whitney Houston, so most of her songs, if not all, uh, is always going to be in some sort of chart, right? <laughs> or billboard. Um, okay, next, we got word of the day. And we're going to be talking about the word genomics. Genomics, it's a noun specifically in the study of biology. And it means study of all of a person's genes, the genome. And now you might, uh, you might have a... Uh, you might have heard about this uh, in, with, with Joe. If not, he might be talking about this soon. All right, anyways, uh, it also includes interactions of those genes with each other and with the person's environment. So it's a more specific branch of biology. There you go. And then lastly, we have our tech trivia. And yeah, we're gonna be talking about uh, something I wouldn't want to call it a disorder or a syndrome, but there is a name for when you feel your phone vibrate, but it doesn't vibrate. <laughs> or it's not really vibrating, but you kind of feel like it's vibrating. It's the phantom vibration syndrome. That is the name for when uh, someone, probably me, because it happened to me before, you know, thinks their phone is vibrating but it's it's actually not it's actually not vibrating right there um research suggests that the cost for this is are you guys ready for this uh it's very obvious is someone being over involved with their phone like the phone all day oh my gosh there you go um i don't have a i mean i guess i did experience uh phantom vibration syndrome before but what i experience more often is like I would I would think I will hear my phone ring or get the text, but actually not, you know. Um, but I have an alibi for that because sometimes my ringtone shares. Uh, I mean, has the same ringtone as other people, or sometimes my my text message would be the same text uh, text tone uh, for some other people too. So hey, I mean, you know. But uh, if if I, if I'm just by myself, uh, yeah, I could say it still happens. <laughs> so, oh man, what a day, right? Anyways, that is the end of our show today, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I hope you like it. I hope you learned something new. Uh, it's it's a pretty good episode. There were a lot of things that we talked about today. Um, again, got a lot of these observances. Uh, feel free to celebrate one of them, two of them, or all of them if you can. Um, also, don't forget to leave your thoughts or your replies about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. And that's for me. I'm probably going to go grab some uh, soft ice cream. Yeah. All right. So I guess I'll just see you guys next time. All right. Bye.